Well, God bless you. I'm so honored to be here. It really is an honor for, for, for me to be able to speak at your church. And, and thank you, Pastor Spiller, for trusting me to your pulpit. I'm, I'm honored. I really am. So thank you. And God bless you. Um, let's start. I just want to pray. Father, we thank you for this amazing morning, God. And, and Lord, I thank you for the word that's about to be released, God. I pray, I pray Lord, that you prepare the soil, God. You prepare it well, God, that the seed will go into fertile soil, God, and that it will grow and it will be strong for all your leaders in this room. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, I have a message today. It's called Faith Takes Risks. And I love this word because, you know, there's something about taking a risk. And I think um, we all designed to kind of stay in the safe zone. Mainly when we're comfortable, mainly when we're doing well, um, everything's working out, we, we tend to want to stay there. Why move, right? When if it works, don't change it. But that's not really how God designed us. It's, it's not how he created us. He created us to go from faith to faith, from glory to glory, and to continue to pursue the purposes of God in our life because we all created with a purpose. And so this word, it, it, I really wanted to, to put this out here. I, I feel like, um, and this is something I'm, I say to myself all the time, because I am, I am one of everyone else that we get comfortable and we don't want to change. And Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the confidence in what we hope for, and assurance about what we do not see. So I love that because the truth is, if we step into faith, we don't know what's going to happen. So you're taking a risk. Everything you do, we pray, we seek God, we fast, whatever we got to do to hear from God before we make a decision. But ultimately, we have to take a risk. We have to step out because God, God is always on time. He's always on time. He's never early. And he's never late. One thing I've learned is he's always on time. I know for me, it's like, God, where are you? And it's like right on time, never a week early or two weeks early. So it's, it, it expands our faith. It helps us to believe in his promises and, and what he says. And do you trust in him? Because we know that God says, I want you to love me with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. And that means we have to trust. So who told you? This really spoke to me when I, when I was studying to come speak to you. In Genesis 3, 1 through 11, we're going to read a little bit. And I just want you to follow along if you have your Bible. It's Genesis 3, and we're going to begin at 1. We're going to the beginning. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the wo woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, 
And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? I want to stop right there. Who told you that you were naked? So we're, we're going right back to the beginning. This is before woman even had a name. This happened. Before she even had an identity. She was just a woman. She didn't have a name. So we're talking, we're going right into the beginning. And God is saying, who told you? And that's where I'm going to stick today. Who told you? Almost everything that stops us from moving forward in life is because we were told. Because we believe. Every one of us were created on purpose. For a great purpose. Every one of us. We did not come from nothing. I know there's many teachings now that we came from an ape or from a monkey or some great explosion happened and here we appeared. But we know that that's not true. We know that we were created. We were planned by God. We were planned in our mother's womb. We were formed. We were put together. We didn't come from nothing. We came from God. We came from God. And even our very parents sometimes, you know, we're called the oopsie baby. Or, you know, that one was planned, but this one was a mistake. And, and even early on in life, sometimes we hear these things. And as parents, you don't say it in a bad way. But the truth is, someone told us. Somewhere we heard this. And it's not true. We were planned. God had a plan for you, for me. We have a purpose. We have a destiny. We didn't just poof, arrive, and now what do we do with this one? God had a plan. We were created in his image. We were created in the image of God, in his likeness. And what is that? That's holy. So before this even happened, we were perfect. We were whole. And then all of a sudden, someone told us we were naked. That's why God asked, who told you? Who told you you were naked? Because you didn't feel naked before. You were whole. The question always got to go back to that. Who told you? Who told you? Who told you you were poor? Who told you you were old? Who told you you're too young? Who told you you're too old? Who told you you're not smart enough? Or maybe someone just told you, you just can't. That's not who we are. That's not what we do. God said you can do all things through Christ. Once we establish the truth, the lie falls. The only way to destroy the lie is to know the truth. And every one of us somehow has limited ourselves to the fullness of who Christ is. Every one of us. We have to remind ourselves daily that I can do all things through Christ. Yes, I'm weak in this body, but in Christ I'm strong. In Christ I'm powerful. In Christ I have the authority and the dominion over the land. Because that's why Christ came. As a perfect seed, he had to come from a virgin. Because if he would have come from Adam, then it would have been that perfect seed. So when we receive Jesus Christ and we say, we're born again. Our old man has died, our new one has resurrected, and, and we know these verses. But do we really believe it is the question. Do we really believe that the person who can't do everything died. And the one that can now lives in me. 
So the, tree, the truth is what outweighs the lie. It's time for us to rise up. This is the time. You are the sons and daughters. The Bible says in Acts that my sons and my daughters will prophesy. My old men will see dreams. He says that in the last days, and that's where it began, that very moment when Holy Spirit, Pentecost, came upon the church, came up, who's the church? You're the church, the body of Christ. And he said, now you have the strength to lead. Because the spirit of the living God lives inside of you. The creator of the universe lives inside of me, lives inside of you. If we confess Christ, this is the truth. So what is it? Who told you that you can't do it? Who told you that you had to be humble and poor? Humble is strength. It's the strength from the Father. But it's not to be poor and low. It's to know who you are in Christ. It's time for us to begin to lead again. The body of Christ to lead. To lead their homes. To lead their schools. To lead in their jobs. Not just be the one on the back burner. But to be the one that says, I, I have the answer. Someone stood up in a, in a school and said, I no longer want prayer to exist. And they stood up boldly. And they decided we will take prayer out the schools because it offends people. But it took someone to lead that movement. It took someone to say, this is what I believe. It took someone to believe in abortion and to pass laws. It took one woman, one woman to stand tall and say women have rights and they should be able to have abortions. So many things that have been led because one person decided to lead. How much more can you do, the body of Christ? Christ says we can do all things in him. We can do everything. Begin to take risks. And do what God has told you to do. Be faithful with his word. His promises are yes and amen. Begin that the, that the wisdom that, that you have held for years can be pouring into your sons and your daughters, your grandchildren. That we don't just be okay with the way things are now, but that we say no. You, are, you, you, are, you don't have to be like that. Christ says you can do all things. You were created in his likeness, in his image. Who told you you can't do it? We raise up a body of people that say, I know who I am in Christ and I'm not, I'm not afraid to step out. I'm not afraid. Faith takes risks. If we stay on the shore and we watch, We'll never make it to the other side. We'll never make it. And the truth is we are no longer in the wilderness. We are in the promised land. I've been sharing with our leaders this past couple of weeks something God has really put on my heart. That this year is a year of promise. That in this year many promises will be unlocked. That you've been praying for. That you've been believing for. But you see, something happened in the wilderness. In the wilderness, manna fell from heaven. There was provision. There was provision that flowed. They ate, they drank. But then something happened in the promised land. Something changed in the promised land. In the promised land, the first thing that was told was go and cook. Go and take. This is the land flowing with milk and honey. Go and do. And for some reason, we get comfortable with the wilderness. We get comfortable with that, that provision. God sustains us. We pray and we get a miracle. We pray, can't do this, and, and God shows up because he's always on time. He's a good, good father. 
But the truth is we have to get to a place of blessing, the place of promise, where we put our hands out and, and it's there. We take, we work, we grab, we begin to take our family and we tell them with authority, this is who you are. We're not waiting anymore. We're not a church of the wilderness. We are a church of promise. Jesus came and fulfilled the promise. So we no longer can live like people who are roaming and waiting and begging. That's not who we are. And once we understand who we are in Christ, something happens. You, you, you feel this, this fullness to want to change the world. It's like, I have what it takes. I have the answer. And that's amazing because that's how we all should be. Sharing the love of Christ, the good news everywhere we go of how good Jesus is. Yes, I have trials. Yes, I have tribulations. But, but Christ has given me peace. He's overcame them all. So in my trials, in my failures, in my biggest chaos, I have peace. Because it was promised. And that's where the world doesn't understand. That's where you become, I'm not of this world. I'm just passing through. And people won't understand. How are you not destroyed by what's happening in your family? How are you not destroyed by what's happening around you? Because I have peace. When I received Jesus, he said I will have abundant life. And for, for years I searched this. I said, God, why is the church hurting and more miserable than me? And I'm not saved. So when I read that scripture, I said something. There's something wrong. We have to get out of the wilderness and come into the promised land. And that word is for all of us. It's a reminder to me daily when I start complaining, when I start murmuring, when I start trying to figure out how are we going to do it. I have to quickly remind myself that God said he will never leave me. He'll never forsake me. He's with me. In the valleys, he's with me in the mountaintops. He never leaves my side. And he's given me the Holy Spirit to walk this out, to strengthen me, to teach me, to guide me. What more do I need? If he's for me, then who could be against me? It is the promises of God. We are his masterpiece. In Ephesians it says we are his masterpiece. I don't know about you, but sometimes I don't feel like his masterpiece. We have to remind ourselves we are. We live in a world where, where people are insecure. If you're overweight, you're not accepted. If you're like this, you're not accepted. If maybe if you're like this, you, don't, you can't be on that front cover of that magazine. The truth is that we are his masterpiece. Just how we are. It doesn't matter. I've got some gray hairs coming in here, and I was looking in the mirror this morning. I did my, I, I, I did my hair, and, and there's just one right here in the middle. And I'm like, really? So I go in the room, I tell my husband, I need you to pull this one hair. He's like, oh my gosh, it's standing perfectly up. Like, it's just there. So he pulls it out and he says, you know, seven more are going to grow back now. I said, no, that's a myth. <laughs> you know, no matter how we are, we're his masterpiece. It doesn't matter what we have to change. You, we have to accept that truth. It's such a beautiful truth. The Bible says in 2 Timothy, which your pastor quoted this morning, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. That's one of my favorite scriptures because it was one of my biggest battles from a child. I battled with fear. I was afraid of everything. 
I heard knows it. Everything made me stop breathing. I was scared all the time. And my dad used to always tell me to memorize that scripture. And every time I was afraid to say it. And now I still use it when it's time to take a risk. When I know that if I don't step out, if you don't step out, then who will? God said, who will tell them? Who will tell them the good news if it's not us? The followers, the believers of Christ. We can't be afraid when we see someone hurting to say, I have the answer. And sometimes that could be with a simple, are you okay? How can I help you? The love, the power of love. We don't have to, we don't have to preach. Our life preaches with the way we are, the love and the kindness that we show. I, I go to a Dunkin' Donuts. I love Dunkin' Donuts better than Tim Hortons. Nobody. <laughs> Liz, please don't. <laughs> I, I just love Dunkin' Donuts. Maybe because I was raised in New York City and that's what I was. I love Dunkin' Donuts. But I told my husband, I says, you know, every time I go to Dunkin' Donuts, they're mean to me. Every, there's not one worker there that is not mean. Like from the time they, they talk on the thing, they're just yelling at me. When I get to the register, it's like, I'm like, Tim Hortons, they're so nice. But I want to go to Dunkin' Donuts. And I, I, I even pray before I get there. I'm like, maybe she'll be nice today. And I feel like she's just like, what do you want? Hurry up and get out of here. And it's just never happy. The workers on the other, you look in, they're all, mm. I'm like, gosh. So I told my husband one day, I, I took it really serious. I said, you know, I'm going to go in there one day. And he's like, please don't. I'm like, no, I am. And I'm going to ask them, why are you all so mean? I love Dunkin' Donuts, and I want to come here, and I'm so nice to you. And he says, don't do that, please. <laughs> I said, maybe, maybe someone just got to tell them. Like, you, you're so awesome. You're so amazing. You get to serve people. And I haven't, I haven't done it yet, but I'm going to take that risk one day. One day, <laughs> I'm believing if God don't want me to do it, he's going to change their hearts, and they're going to start being nice. But it's just so amazing how we deal with these things in life. And I'm not moved by it. I've, I've, I don't get upset how bad they treat me. It doesn't, I just keep, I have like this big burden for Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> you know, it's like, gosh. So we, we hear these things and, and we, we bump into people who, you know, they flick you off while you're driving and, and, and just, just not, not happy. And we get to a point in our work, walk with God where we just have compassion. Like, why? Why are, why, are, why are you so mad? Why are you so angry? And that's a good compassion. It's how we should be. We shouldn't give in and get just as angry. We should get to a point, I know who I am in Christ. I, I bear the fruit of kindness, love, and I'm believing that one day it's going to manifest in Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> so you, 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 hear, you hear things like, you probably heard, I, I believe most of you probably have all heard these things. Don't count your chickens before they hatch. Somebody told you that, and you believe that. If something is too good to be true, it probably is. There's so many things that, that we've learned and we actually live by these quotes that are totally against the word of God. Because actually, the Bible says that faith is what is hoped for. So that means if I'm not hoping for all those chickens to hatch, I'm probably not going to see it because I have to see it before I see it. If you can't see it, then you probably won't see it. Because faith is what you cannot see. So we're believing to see something, but we still haven't seen it. It's, it that's tricky, right? It's so tricky because don't, don't, don't get your promises up because then you won't get hurt. If, if, you, if, if you expect something great, 
And if you, you don't, you, you're going to get hurt. Because then when you don't get it, you're going to be hurt. So we set us ourselves up for nothing. For nothing greater. When God says we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. When he promises us that he will give us everything and anything we need and want. It may not be in your timing. It may not be in your timing. Because many times he, he, he spends time preparing us. For these things we want. Because if he gives it to us, it will destroy us. And most likely take us away from him. I tell our leaders we're doing first fruit offerings on the 18th of February. And I tell everybody, expect. Lynn, Lynn has a greenhouse and, and she plants and she's preparing her seeds already. And I say, when you put a seed in the ground for a pepper, you expect a pepper. You're watching for the pepper to grow. You're waiting for it. How many of us have planted seeds, prayers, but we're not expecting anything? We're just begging and asking. We have to gain a heart of expectation. I expect because I have a good, good father. Our children, when they ask us for something, they expect it. And they'll keep asking until they get it. And they'll do whatever they got to do. They'll beg, they'll plea, until you're finally like, okay. Unless it's going to affect them. Unless it's going to hurt them, then you make them wait. But how great is our God? We have to erase the lies that have been rooted inside of us. That I can't do that. I'm too old. I'm too young. There's a purpose. And if you are still breathing, there is a purpose in your life. There is someone you can lead. There is someone you can teach. Oh, I'm not a teacher. I'm not. That's not who I. Holy Spirit is. He's the greatest teacher. I'm not a doctor. Can't heal. Got to take people. Jesus is the greatest physician. When we pray, let's pray expecting with, with a heart of gratitude that it's coming, that it's happening, even as we speak, believing. James 4.13 says, now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city. We'll spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why you do, why you do not even know what will happen tomorrow? What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you are to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. Today. You start today. You may not be able to see the fruit of what you sowed today. But remember, you are but a mist. I, I brought this spray bottle because I really feel like sometimes we forget what a mist is. When I spray this, it's, it's a vapor. And now it's gone. Do you see it anymore? That's what it's saying. You're a mist. You appear for a little while and then you vanish. It's gone. It's finished. But yet we keep saying, I'll do that tomorrow. I'll talk to her tomorrow. I'll deal with that tomorrow. Tomorrow's not promised. It's today. Today is the day we have to take risks. Because we may not get that opportunity again. Today is the day we have to love the people who've hurt us. We have to forgive them today. God's working on my heart. One day I'll be healed and I'll forgive. No, today you've been forgiven much. We can't say that. We have to believe that God is going to work it out. Step out, take a risk of faith, even if it doesn't feel good. Even if you know you're not ready. Sometimes we have to say, Holy Spirit, I need you. I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to say this. And sometimes you got to say, I'm sorry, and run. 
(laughs) But guess what? You step out. What are the visions and dreams God has put on your heart? There's so many visions and dreams that go dormant. They fall asleep. And God wants us to dream. He's given you dreams and visions for your family. And we got to believe. It doesn't matter where you are, where you begin, but believe, trust in the Lord. And begin to, maybe the dreams will be fulfilled through your children or your grandchildren. But it doesn't mean they're over. It doesn't mean they're finished. Maybe if you share them, you'll find out. Someone will say, wow, that's what I've always wanted to do. Serve here at your church. Humble yourself to learn new things. Be in unity with the vision, with the purpose of Portland Congregational. This is your body. This is where you're planted. Begin to serve. Take time out of our busy schedule. I always tell our leaders, you created your schedule. When they tell me I haven't had time to pray. I don't know if I can make that because I don't have time. You create your schedule. And if you left God out of it, then you did that. The Bible says I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So now I'm stressed. And I'm going crazy because you are not in this Christ. It's my agenda. We have to get back to making sure he is the one. And then when you begin to step out and take risks and begin to, to dream and envision, it feels good. It's not a burden. I've learned that whenever I'm, I'm even in ministry, when I'm feeling burdened, it's because somehow I left Christ. And I'm doing things on my own. I know quickly I'm stressed. My neck hurts, my back hurts, my head hurts. I'm just a mess because I'm doing a hundred things. And guess what? I forgot to call the author, the beginner, the finisher of my faith to help me. So even in ministry and motherhood and grand, being a grandmother, we want to help and we want to we take care of everyone's needs. We want to serve. But then we get emptied out. And we feel hurt and stressed. But when we keep God first, you are all leaders in this place. Whether you have a title, whether you have a position, you are a leader. Because if you have Christ inside of you, you are an ambassador of Christ. And I believe ambassadors are leaders. You are leaders. I don't know who told you. You weren't. Or who told you you couldn't? But the truth is today I want you to know that you can. If you just breathe and you can do that, you're still alive and you still have a purpose. It's not over. It's not finished. We still can take a risk. We still can step out in faith. We still can believe for change, for love. My bishop always says, it's impossible to eat an elephant. And then he says, no, it's not. You eat it one bite at a time. Who's heard, you can't lead a horse to water. You can't make him drink. That's a lie too, give him some salt pills. (laughs) He'll get real thirsty. There's always a way. There's always a way. Christ always makes a way. And that's what I want to share with you today. I want us to really allow the Holy Spirit to just give us that fresh wind. Because we all get tired. The Bible says don't get weary in doing good because in good, in due time you will receive your harvest. Don't get tired of watering a seed because in due time you will see it grow. 
Don't get tired when things look dead. Right now, everything looks dead. Guess what? The root systems are getting strong in the ground. And soon we will see the flowers bloom. They're not dead. There's nothing dead unless it has no breath. We can speak Christ and we can tell dry bones to rise up and come alive. You have the power to do that. You have the power to do that. We sing these, these amazing songs. God, you're a good, good father. You're the healer. And then many of us leave here. I do sometimes. I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to myself. Every sermon I preach, I got to go home and when I, I got to say, hey, I just said that and I need to live it. I get convicted and I believe that our, the word of God, we have to continue to confess it over our life daily. Because so easy we can forget who we are in Christ. One problem can just spin us around. So I want you to stand to your feet today. And I, I really want, want us to, to just believe that Holy Spirit is here. He's here. And he is the one, every prayer... I know what many of us, we hear all these prayer requests and, and quickly we can get so, oh, that compassion, that's the love of Christ. We begin to feel that, that pain for, for our brothers and sisters and, and oh God, please, you are the answer. Your prayers are the answers. Your prayers, God is listening to every one of them. He knows the, your heart. He knows who you, you call out for. He, hears, he knows every tear you shed when no one's watching. He knows when you're up at night and you can't sleep because you're worried about your grandbabies or your children, that they will find the Lord. I believe this is the year, church. This is the year of promises, and I know we've heard these things many times. 18 signifies life. I love that. So I believe that things that have been dead for so long are going to come to life in 2018. Things you've been praying for, maybe it's your finances, maybe it's your children, maybe it's your health. God can do it. Don't give up. Oh, I'm too old. This is just how an old body feels. No, the Bible says that Caleb was, he, 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 gets, he got strength and he became strong. At 87, he was like as young as his youth. He was faithful and he believed. He was willing. Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't say that's not for me, that's for them. Who told you? Who told you? That's what God said. Who told you? I told you that I created you in my likeness and my image. I breathed life into you, I said, and you came alive. So who told you that you're too old or you're too young or your time is up or you're just retired? We're just hanging out now. Oh, God, the prayers of those intercessors at home are changing the world. You matter. Yes. 